Okay. Last time we talked about the uh, election of 1844, and we talked about how uh, Polk, the Democratic nominee, who was technically a black horse candidate, came out of nowhere. Nobody really expected uh, Polk to get the nomination. Most people still thought it would be uh, someone like Van Buren or uh, maybe even somebody like Tyler, who uh, was kind of a man without a party, but was the sitting president. But instead, at the convention, they pick Polk after about nine ballots, and he becomes the presidential nominee. We talked last time about the four things that he promised to do. Polk sort of plan uh, after uh, becoming president all right, was uh, to, uh, let me get over here. Lower the tariff, resolve the Oregon boundary dispute, restore the independent treasury, and acquire California. Congress will help him do uh, number one and number three. The tariff will be lowered. Uh, the uh, independent treasury will be restored. Uh, but the other two, Polk is going to have to do through foreign policy. Now, during the campaign, we talked last time about 54-40 or fight, that Polk said that unless we got the northern boundary of uh, Oregon and thus the entire Oregon Territory, that we would uh, end up fighting for it. And uh, I told you guys that that is not what happened. That instead, solving the Oregon dispute involves us extending the boundary, the 49th degree or the 49th parallel boundary that already existed uh, thanks to uh, John Quincy Adams and the Transcontinental Tree, that we'll just instead extend the 49th parallel out to uh, Vancouver Island, give Vancouver Island to Canada, and that becomes the settled border. I remember Polk said that he would settle the dispute, and he does. He doesn't do it through 54-40 or fight, but we do end up with a settlement for, for Oregon. And so uh, this pretty much leaves us and grants us, when you think about it, a quarter to the Pacific. Okay, We now have the ability to, I'm going to go back to this map here. Okay, We can move from... Uh, St. Louis here, okay, up the Oregon Trail, and then out to the Pacific, right? So we have the ability now to move goods uh, from the interior all the way to the West Coast now, too, as a result of the settling of uh, the Oregon boundary dispute. But the other thing that he made clear was that he wanted to take control and to acquire California. And uh, the acquisition of California, his stated goal is going to prompt a war. Okay? Relations between the United States and Mexico already were terrible. And uh, the desire to acquire California is simply going to make those worse. And we'll end up at war over them. Okay? Well, how does that happen? Well, it's pretty simple. Okay? The, uh, the Mexican War is, uh, in a lot of ways and outgrowth of what we've been talking about, Manifest Destiny. That we believed it was our God-given right to expand uh, throughout this continent. And uh, one of the groups that was in the way are, or is Mexico, one of the countries in our way, is Mexico. And so uh, they are going to uh, get a solid push here and uh, we're going to uh, come away with some territory, mainly because Polk takes this very aggressive stance. All right, let's go back and remind ourselves about a couple of things, okay? That one of uh, the things that's going to prompt the Mexican War is that on the eve of Polk becoming uh, president, Tyler had introduced into Congress, and Congress had approved uh, the idea of annexing Texas. So before Polk ever became president, 
Tyler and Congress pushed through uh, a joint resolution that annexed Texas, and now Texas is part of uh, the uh, the United States. It comes in as a uh, a state; doesn't come in as a territory. So Texas will come in, uh, and uh, of course, much to the chagrin of Mexico, who is furious about this. Okay. So what had been the Republic of Texas has now been annexed by the United States on the eve of Polk's election in 1844, or on the eve of Polk becoming president. During the campaign, remember, and uh, in his really first message to Congress after becoming president, Polk made it clear that the acquisition of California was a major goal. And so he will begin to move towards uh, that goal. He will send, uh, all right, John Slidell, one of his cabinet ministers, and uh, I think a former governor of New York, Slidell will be sent to Mexico to deal with uh, the Mexican government. And Slidell is authorized by the president, is authorized by Polk to negotiate for several things, okay? Now, I'm actually going to go backwards from what I have them up here, okay? So, uh, I want you to kind of uh, go backwards with me. Because remember, one of the things that Polk, said, that Polk had said was we're going to acquire California. And so, uh, Slidell is authorized to uh, tell the Mexican government that we will pay any price to acquire California. So in other words, if Mexico would name their price, we would pay it to acquire California. So it's pretty clear that the goal here is to acquire California. But Slidell is also, also authorized to tell uh, the Mexican government that we will also purchase the area that is referred to as New Mexico we will purchase that from the Mexican government for $5 million. We would also be willing to uh, forgive American citizens' claims against the Mexican government that date back to uh, the, the Texas Revolution. All in all, you're talking about three, three and a half million dollars or so in uh, claims that American citizens have against the Mexican government that are just waiting to be, ad really, to go through the justice system, waiting to be adjudicated, okay? And so there's a chance that if that happens, of course, Mexico would owe a substantial amount of money to American citizens. All right, none of these, none of these are very appealing to the Mexican government who, remember, is already very upset about the whole Texas thing. And then, Slidell sort of drops a bomb on them. We also would like the Mexican government to recognize the Rio Grande as uh, the border between the United States and Mexico. The Texas-U.S. border between uh, Texas and the United States and uh, Mexico. So we ask for that border to be the Rio Grande. All right, let me show you what that does, okay? If you look at this map, okay, over here, if I can get over there, okay? If you look at this map, okay, if I can get this to work, let me show you kind of what we're talking about here, okay? The existing border, or what Mexico thinks the existing border is, is the old Republic of Texas border, okay, which is right, and I'm going to draw it on the map. It's this area right here, okay? Everybody kind of see that? I don't know why I shot that out there, but anyway, sorry. That, that is a river, okay, called the Nueces. So there is a river 
right there. I don't know why that's doing that. Well, now you can't even really see it at all. Stupid computer. All right, call the new races. Okay. Okay, everybody see it right there? Okay, so that is the Nueces River. Okay, and it runs right up through there. Okay. And that is what Mexico thought the boundary was and should be. Okay. Now let's kind of move right down here. And what do you see? This right here, this line that you see right here is kind of familiar to most of you. Okay, because that's the existing border today. Okay, what river is that? The Rio Grande. Okay, so notice how it changes things, okay? That we are asking Mexico to recognize the Rio Grande as the border, which means that all of this territory, this purple area that you see right up here, all of that, and of course, this area that then kind of falls in right up here, because that's above the Rio Grande, right? Would become United States territory, and that would become the existing border between the United States and Mexico. Well, you can probably guess that the Mexican government is not super happy about that either, right? And so here we are. We've sent Slidell to Mexico and he has offered basically several things that the Mexican government does not want, does not care about, and is probably just downright insulting. Okay? It would be like your neighbor uh, who is a uh, vacuum cleaner salesman coming to your house, all right, and uh, bullying his way into your house and trying to sell you. Uh, all right, all of his vacuum cleaners and vacuum cleaner uh, attachments, okay? And then also telling you, hey, by the way, I'm going to put a fence up that goes up here against your driveway, okay? Even though that takes up some of your uh, lawn, I think it would look better up against your driveway. So I'm just going to take some of your lot and fence it in. Well, you guys realize that that's not going to go over very well, okay? And so, as you can probably guess, the Mexican government is tremendously unhappy about that. We, or at least Polk, believes that there could be a, uh, maybe an attempt by the Mexican government to uh, reinforce its position. And so, uh, so I will tell you that Polk is going to try to poke the bear here, okay? He's going to try to goad the Mexican government. And so, uh, if you look right up here, you guys can see that American forces began to move out of Corpus Christi. They will move down here to the Nueces. And then Zachary Taylor, who's in control of this, these American forces, will push his forces down to the Rio Grande. Okay? So really, the American army under Zachary Taylor here has taken up a position in September of 1846 or so, right along the Rio Grande. All right. If you're in Mexico, why are you super unhappy about that? What do you think the border is? Not the Rio Grande, but the other river, right? So technically, if you're in Mexico, these American forces have taken up a position where? On Mexican territory, right? They are actually invaders. Okay. We are pretty inflexible about this, okay? And in fact, Mexico tries to even uh, 
say that the border ought to be, the border of Texas ought to be the Sabine River, which would push it way inland. So uh, this is not a very pleasant debate between the United States and Mexico over the border of Texas. Okay. With American troops kind of firmly in Mexican territory, all you really need is some sort of, uh, well, accident. Okay. And we get it. Mexican forces and American forces will clash in a small little uh, skirmish at Matamoros right here, okay, in uh, May of 1846. Polk will immediately go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. So when American and Mexican troops skirmish along the Rio Grande at, at Matamoros, this is the break that Polk was looking for. And he will go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war. He is very firm. He is very dramatic in his request for a uh, declaration of war against Mexico. One of the highlights of his speech is uh, where he uh, claims that American blood has been shed on American soil, must be avenged. Okay. How dramatic. Okay. We've been attacked. American blood. These soldiers that were killed in the skirmish at Matamoros, they've been killed. Their blood has been spilt on American soil. So really portraying the Mexican government as, or the Mexican army as bandits, as invaders. All right, knuckleheads. Where's Matamoros? It's on the other side of the Rio Grande, right? Matamoros is not in Texas. Okay. What did I tell you that Taylor had taken up a position? Well, on the Rio Grande, right? But to be at Matamoros, he's actually crossed the Rio Grande. And so technically, where is he? He's in Mexico, right? How can American blood be spilt on American soil if those people whose blood's being spilt, they're actually in Mexico? Oops. Doesn't matter. The declaration of war will make its way through the House and the Senate. It will be briskly debated, mind you. Okay? But it will pass the House on a vote of like 174 to 14. It will pass the Senate by a vote of something like 40 to 2. Okay. So, but there is some debate. Okay. One of the most famous pieces of the debate came when a young congressman that demanded that the president show uh, the Americans the exact spot where uh, American blood had been shed on American soil. That spot resolution, as it was called, was introduced by Abraham Lincoln. Okay. So uh, there are some new players on the block, and uh, really the Mexican War is one of the first times you get to see some of them uh, shine. There are a lot inside of Congress that believe uh, that the president manipulated this war, that the president may have started this war, okay? The House then passed, or the, uh, the Congress then passed an appropriations bill calling for 50,000 volunteers, a $10 million appropriation, okay. Here's some numbers for you. 
How prepared are we for war? As usual, not. It was estimated that Mexico may have had 32,000 troops available and ready to go into the field. We had about 8,000, if we're lucky. Some scholars believe our troop strength was actually somewhere around 7,300 or so. So we are outnumbered, uh, depending on who you talk to, by four or five to one, okay, when the war begins. We don't have very good communications. We don't have very good transportation. There are not a lot of provisions for sanitation or for health. About 10% of our casualties will be uh, soldiers who die from disease or health, real health related issues. Okay. But Mexico is not much better. They have terrible flaws themselves and not very good leadership, okay? Now, as the debate sort of uh, begins to uh, wind down, okay? As the debate sort of begins to, I'm gonna take this out for a second if I can. Figure out how to do that. There we go. As uh, the uh, the bill begins to uh, to launch the war, begins to make its way uh, through Congress. This happens. Okay, it's called the Wilmot Proviso. Okay, the Wilmot Proviso. Really, what he wanted it to do, Congressman David Wilmot from Pennsylvania, wanted this attached to the declaration of war or to one of the bills that would have funded the war, okay? Read the uh, underlying part for me. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of said territory. So read the whole thing. Provided a territory from that as an express and fundamental condition to the acquisition of any Territory from the Republic of Mexico by the United States by virtue of any treaty which may be negotiated between them and to use by the executive of the monies here and appropriated, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of that said territory. It does not make it out of the, uh, the Congress. It will not make it through the Senate. Excuse me, but tell me what's going on here. Okay, this is the second time that we've seen something like this pop up. Okay, we saw it in 1820, and now we see it again. What does the Wilmot Proviso, what's it trying to do? Ban slavery from any of the territories that we take from Mexico. So let's say we do acquire California. Let's say we do acquire New Mexico. What Wilmot wanted uh, in there was an express forbiddance of the expansion of slavery. Now, he does not say anything about where slavery already exists, okay? He does not say that all slavery should be abolished. What does he say? No slavery in the territories that we get from Mexico. Okay? It doesn't win, it doesn't come out. But again, you can probably guess that that worries the South and worries every Southern uh, governor, every Southern legislator, 
Okay? Because so much of the Deep South is tied to cotton, and they're afraid that any attempt to limit slavery is a direct attack on their way of life. So, Wilmot's proviso here, even though it does not come out from Congress, okay, scares the South to death. And they realize, really, that their way of life could soon come under attack. Hmm. Fighting the war does not take very long. Okay, the uh, the war actually goes in about three different phases. Okay, in the summer of eighteen forty six. Okay, in the summer of eighteen forty six and early eighteen forty seven, there are American forces engaged out here in California under the leadership of uh, this guy. Okay. John C. Fremont. Okay. So uh, Fremont has been dispatched out to California, and American forces will uh, begin to uh, try to break away California from uh, Mexico. So uh, all of the fighting right out here is uh, done by uh, John C. Fremont or by Stephen Watts Kearney who, if you kind of follow Kearney's uh, line, he left Leavenworth, okay, made his way through parts of Texas, okay, and then uh, ended up heading towards what is today San Diego. So you've got American forces that are pushing out into New Mexico and out into California. You also have two American armies that are invading Mexico. Okay, One that is under the command of Zachary Taylor, which is this army that you see right up here. And there's another army that you guys can see that goes down the coast here, turns at Veracruz, and invades uh, towards the capital of Mexico City. That army is under the command of Winfield Scott. Okay. Both of those guys, Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott, will become heroes and both will run for president eventually. Okay, one wins, one doesn't. Okay, you might know which one wins. Who? Yeah. Thank God we never had a president, Winfield Scott. I mean, geez. I mean, look at him. I mean, Winfield. Who names their kid Winfield? Okay. But Zachary Taylor was the hero to battle Palo Alto, very outnumbered as we were throughout the war. American forces at Palo Alto uh, turned around a uh, Mexican army, pushed it into retreat. The Navy bombards Veracruz before Winfield Scott's army gets on the ground. And he will push inland, and Winfield Scott will win a major battle at a place called Buena Vista, and then uh, he will enter Mexico City. So in about 17 months or so, not even quite a year and a half, we have uh, pushed our way into Mexico. We are uh, camped out in uh, Mexico City. Stephen Watts Kearney and uh, John C. Fremont have pushed the Mexican army out of uh, the American Southwest. And Mexico really has no choice. Okay? There is really, this war was, I hate to say that, but this war was over really before it ever started. And Mexico uh, finds out pretty quickly that they are totally outclassed and uh, they do not do very well. In 1848, they asked for peace, okay? And uh, Nicholas Trist, the guy that you see up there, will be the American negotiator. So uh, we will negotiate with Mexico City, or excuse me, with the Mexican government, from Mexico City, really. 
So uh, there is, they ask for peace, okay? Nicholas Trist sort of handles the negotiations, okay? And on really the 2nd of February, 1848, the negotiations uh, will uh, come to a close, okay? Let's kind of take a look at what the treaty does. And you tell me how well we do and how well, how poorly Mexico did, okay? Mexico gave up all claims to Texas above the Rio Grande River. What was Slidell asking for at the beginning of the war? For Mexico to recognize what? The Rio Grande as the border. Do they? Yes. Mexico will give the United States, California, and New Mexico. But we will give Mexico $15 million and agree to pay the American claims, the, the uh, claims of American citizens that they had against the Mexican government, which is really an additional about $3.5 million. So Mexico comes away with about $18.5 million. What do we get? Everything in green is what we come away with. And that is huge, right? So we get everything to the Rio Grande. We get today what would be uh, considered, uh, right, look at the states that come out of this, okay? Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, California, right? Part of, Cal well, part of Colorado, okay? New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, California, and of course the rest of Texas. This is massive. It's massive. What did it cost us? Okay. What did it cost us? War cost us about $100 million and about 13,000 Americans were killed during the war. Trust me, most of those 13,000 died from disease, not from uh, weapons fire. An overwhelming majority of those casualties came from disease. We will add in about a million square miles of land if we include Texas, which sounds good. But the debate about the expansion of slavery into these areas is now going to become a centerpiece of national politics. The question about what to do with slavery and slavery's expansion into these areas becomes a huge national debate. We also said that it would create two Whig generals that will run for president, one successfully, one not so successfully. And again, it's another part of Manifest Destiny. Expansion from uh, sea to shining sea, this is our continent, okay? So we've added more territory. More territory for people to now move out into. But the problem is, will those people that move out into these areas bring slaves with them? 
And that is going to become a huge debate. All right. After four years, okay, Polk has done all four of his things, right? Polk's four-point program is finished. So Polk's not going to run for president again. This is such a novel idea. Okay, what a great idea. Make a plan, go out and execute it. Once you're done, go home. Okay? And uh, that is what Polk did. Okay? And so the 1848 election, uh, we'll see uh, several new contenders, new faces. Okay? Now, the front runner is our buddy Zachary Taylor, the hero of uh, the Mexican War. Okay, Taylor and Taylor's uh, war record uh, is going to uh, make him a tough candidate. Okay, so Zachary Taylor uh, is uh, one of our leading uh, candidates. Okay. The Democrats, without Polk running again, have to come up with uh, their own candidate. Okay, and so uh, <coughs> they will. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. They will eventually settle on this guy. Uh, his name is Lewis Cass, He's from Michigan. His vice president is a guy named, uh, he's a general named uh, William Butler from Kentucky. Now, Cass and the Democrats have to start taking into account ideas about slavery, okay? Cass is famous for developing a theory, if you will, about slavery's expansion or potential expansion. Okay. It will be Cass that will come up with the, the idea of uh, what we will later call popular sovereignty. Basically, what Cass says and what Cass is thinking is that once these areas, remember they were not organized yet, they're just territories, right? There's nobody out here. That when these areas began to organize, they should have a choice. They can either come into the Union as free states or they can come into the Union as slave states. But we should not decide that for them. Each individual state should do that. So it should be left up to the people of that particular state. And that's why we call it popular sovereignty. Okay. So Cass's ideas, okay, are uh, to allow each of uh, these areas, once they organize, to choose whether or not they want to be slave or free. Okay? Now, Zachary Taylor, who is uh, the Whig candidate, okay, was a slaveholder. He was from, he had a uh, plantation in Louisiana, okay, and so he is a slaveholder. His running mate is a guy named Millard Fillmore, who was from New York. The Whigs basically emphasized Taylor's military career okay, and reputation. So they're basically running him as the hero candidate. Okay? So, uh, and because he's a slaveholder, you can probably guess why he's going to get a little bit of support from uh, the South. 
The third candidate is good old Martin Van Buren. Former President Van Buren will run for president again in 1848, this time as a candidate from the Free Soil Party. The Free Soil Convention okay, endorses Van Buren. They made it pretty clear that they supported things like the failed Wilmot Proviso. Their slogan, free soil, free speech, free labor, free men. There were a lot of people that began to sort of gravitate towards the Free Soil Party, okay? Barn burners, they were discontented Northern Democrats. They got that name because uh, somebody said that they were like the farmer who would uh, rather burn down his barn than to deal with the mice inside, okay? So they are very disgruntled members of the Democratic Party and they will join the Free Soil Party. Of course, members, anti-slavery groups are going to gravitate towards the Free Soil Party. And of course, like we said, they oppose the extension of slavery into the new territories. Van Buren becomes their chosen candidate. Okay. By the way, Polk retires and dies within three months of leaving office. He has the shortest retirement, really, of any president up to this point. So he leaves office, and three months later, he's dead. So Zachary Taylor, as you guys can tell from the election results, wins the election. It's a pretty close vote when you look at the numbers of popular votes. It's, I mean, it's a decently close electoral vote, too. Okay. So uh, it is a, um, it's really a pretty divided country. And uh, Taylor is able to uh, eke out a victory. Okay. He carries some southern states, and that was probably one of the big differences. Okay, you notice he carries his home state of Louisiana, but he also uh, carried uh, Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky, North Carolina, and those are some big states when it comes to the electoral college. But he also was able to carry Pennsylvania and New York. Okay, so. Uh, he has some pretty widespread support. He gets a lot of uh, support from the South because he's technically a slaveholder. Okay? He uh, gets some support from the North because he's a Whig. He doesn't like Jacksonian politics and uh, is kind of the anti-Jackson elite kind of president. Okay? So that's how it all sort of runs out. From here on out, guys, one of the things you kind of have to understand is that virtually everything from here on out revolves around slavery. Somehow or another, we're going to tie to slavery and thus becomes one of the causes of the Civil War in many ways. Okay? The new Congress that came into session, 112 Democrats, 109 Whigs, 13 Free Soilers, in the Senate, the Democrats had about a 10-seat majority, but there was, it's a very bitterly divided Congress. For example, it took them three weeks and 63 ballots to choose a Speaker of the House. Okay. So it is a bitter, bitter uh, group that assembles uh, in Washington as the Congress, okay? 
Taylor is going to have to uh, make some decisions about this sort of slave issue. Okay. And ordinarily, he might not have had to uh, deal with it, okay? Because it would have taken many Americans a while to push their way out into some of these new territories. But in 1848 and then in 1849, people that were uh, digging around in the dirt in uh, California found what? Gold. And by 1849, the California gold rush is on, which is going to pump tons of people out west into California looking for gold. Okay. So people will push either coming into California by sea. By the way, if you're in New York and you want to get to California and you want to take a boat, what do you got to do? You got to go all the way around South America, okay? Because there's no Panama Canal yet. So think about that. You have to go all the way down uh, the east coast of South America, turn around, and go all the way back up, okay? Your other choice, of course, is to follow those trails westward dumping you out into Utah territories and other places, okay? but out here into the gold fields of uh, California. Okay? And so uh, these mountain ranges, the Sierra Nevadas and others that are just to uh, the, uh, the east of places like San Francisco and Sacramento, this is uh, the areas that we're talking about. Okay? And so uh, Sutter's Mill, the place that started it all, is right there, kind of in the middle. By the way, the miners that began to flood into this area were called 49ers. Because what year is it? It's 1849, okay? What's the name of the San Francisco uh, professional football team? The San Francisco what? 49ers. Color their helmets. Gold. The idea? Okay. So, Gold Rush pulls all these people out here. So what? Big deal. Who cares? Well, what happens? When all these people start flooding into California, what suddenly can California do? Out of nowhere, California has enough population to do what? become a state. So see, if the gold was never discovered, it would have taken people years to uh, push out into these regions, right? And the evolution of statehood in some of these places would have been a much slower pace. But no, somebody discovers gold, uh, and literally thousands of people start flooding into this area. And uh, you are going to have the gold rush, which makes California ready for statehood much faster than anyone really uh, imagined. Okay. <clears throat> this is going to cause an issue. Okay. Okay, how is this going to cause an issue? Well, let's go back to, I'm going to go back to this map for a second. This is California, right? Anybody see that? Missouri is uh, right over here, okay? And so we can see the Missouri River right there. Okay, and so let's say uh, you go back and uh, you draw uh, the 3630 line from uh, here across our old Missouri Compromise line, okay? 
where would it go through? It would go through California, splitting California kind of right down the middle almost. So what does that mean? Does California come in as a slave state or as a free state? Great question. Could California have supported cotton production? Don't know. Maybe. What I tell you has become so important to the Southerners. Protecting what? The balance of power. And if you start letting these states come into the Union so fast, that's going to tilt the balance of power. Now, let's face it. They know. They're not idiots. Okay? Texas is going to have cotton. But can you grow cotton in Arizona or in New Mexico or uh, in Nevada? No. Because it's all what? It's all desert. Okay? So those states will eventually organize and come in, and they're not going to have any choice but to come in as free states because they can't support cotton and they can't support that kind of agriculture. So the question, of course, becomes is, what kind of state is California going to be? And California, as it starts to prepare itself for statehood, makes it very clear that they want to come into the Union as a free state, which is going to uh, terrify Southerners. And they're going to try their best to keep it from happening. The other thing that you got to kind of think about, okay, is uh, as we kind of link ourselves together here, okay, that we have uh, added all of this territory, which was part of the Mexican session and Texas annexation, okay, the Oregon country is up here, okay, so we've gotten that. Okay, we've gotten uh, territory up here because of the Webster-Ashburton Treaty and all that other good stuff, all right? So, our boundaries are pretty set, okay? So, you look over here, St. Louis is over here. You've got industrialization going on up here. You've got cotton down here, okay? By the 1850s, we already talked about this, okay? Railroads have become uh, the link to many of these areas. And so what's going to become the next major drive to do what? To link these areas to these areas using what? The railroad, the transcontinental railroad. What route is it going to take? Okay. A lot of people up here wanted that route to go... Uh, Kind of this way, okay? Okay? Southerners wanted the route to go uh, this way. Why? The South could get its cotton out through there, like that. Could get its cotton out like that, right? And if it came all the way out here, it could do what? Get its cotton out that way, right? Huh. This is the reason why in 1853 we buy this little chunk of territory from Mexico. It's called the Gadsden Purchase. And uh, it was bought basically because we thought that this would be a better route to get out to California because you would avoid most of this. What's that right there? The mountains. So uh, there was a, uh, a push to do the railroad this way. Okay, but most of the people in the north especially wanted to see it to take a more northerly route. 
which is going to uh, put it going right through this area right here, okay, Kansas and Nebraska. That's going to become a big deal later, trust me. But as we get to 1850, we've got to deal with California, okay? California has got to be dealt with. It's really starting to become a constitutional crisis. Because here you have a state that has made all of uh, the requirements, met all the requirements, excuse me, to become a state, okay? But yeah, we can't get into the union. It's going to take a last ditch compromise on the part of Henry Clay. Again, Clay is going to, uh, maybe this might be his one of his finest hours. Clay is going to craft a proposal that is going to get California into the Union. It's going to take several major laws to get it done. We lump those together and do uh, something called the Omnibus Bill, but today historians call it the Compromise of 1850. And it's all about California, but trust me, there are lots of things lurking uh, underneath. Okay, all right, we'll stop there. Okay. I will uh, talk about the uh, Compromise of 1850 and uh, some of this other stuff next time. Okay. Remember, I'm going to put these lectures up into uh, the uh, 